Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased you could join us today, whether you're here in the theater or joining us through Facebook or YouTube. Before we hear from Richard Brookheiser about his new biography of John Marshall, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up this week in the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow, our Veterans Day celebration continues with a program on support and resources available for Vietnam veterans called Remembering Veterans, a conversation of what happens after duty on our country. Former Senator and Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and Congressman Sam Johnson will deliver remarks and will be joined by a panel of Vietnam veterans who are current and former representatives of the Vietnam Veterans of America, Disabled American Veterans, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. And on Thursday, November 15th at 7, we'll host the U.S. premiere of the Tokyo Trials, a documentary created in observance of the 70th anniversary of the Tokyo War Crimes Trials at the end of World War II. Check our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside to get email updates on other activities and programs here at the National Archives. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities. As you know, the National Archives preserves the records of the federal government, among them the most significant documents in our history and growth as a nation. In 2003, when we opened the public vaults ex exhibition upstairs, we asked the public to vote on a list of 100 milestone documents of American history. Three of those 100 are decisions issued by John Marshall's Supreme Court, Marbury versus Madison, McCullough versus Maryland, and Gibbons versus Ogden. John Marshall is such a towering figure of the Supreme Court of the United States that many people believe he was the first Chief Justice. He was the fourth, but his record holding 34 years as Chief Justice, he was the most influential. The precedent-setting decisions issued by his court have stood for two centuries and shaped the role of the judicial branch of our government. Richard Brookhouse's first article for National Review was published the day after his 15th birthday. He went to work for the National Review after graduating from Yale and has stayed ever since. For 20 years, he wrote a column for the New York Observer and has also written for a number of magazines, including The New Yorker, Cosmopolitan Commentary, and Vanity Fair. After writing about modern politicians, he turned to past political figures and became a historian of the founding period. He curated Alexander Hamilton, the man who made modern America, an exhibition at the New York Historical Society before the Broadway show, and hosted two films that aired on PBS, Rediscovering George Washington and Rediscovering Alexander Hamilton. He's currently a col columnist for American history and has been awarded the National Medal of Humanities and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Please welcome Richard Brookheiser. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for coming out. Uh, book publicity is pretty hectic. I was uh, in Richmond yesterday, and I realized when I was flying to New York on Sunday, about halfway down, I'd forgot to pack my blazer. Uh, but I'm doing better than John Marshall, who the first time he served as a circuit court judge, which is something justices of the Supreme Court did till after the Civil War. He had to go to Raleigh, and he forgot to pack a pair of pants. <laughs> uh, when he got to Raleigh, the local tailors were too busy to supply his lack, so he uh, did his duties covered only in his judicial robe. <laughs> so I've spared you that. Uh, about two months ago, a friend asked me 
if I had paid Justice Kennedy to retire in order to publicize my book. And of course, I had, I had no idea that we'd have the Kavanaugh hearings. But I knew the Supreme Court would be in the news. I knew there'd be some decision that would be in the news, possibly a personnel change that would be in the news. The Supreme Court is always in the news. And the man who first put it there was the fourth Chief Justice, John Marshall. So today what I want to do is talk a little bit about who he was, uh, talk about how he accomplished this, how he raised the prestige of the court. I want to look at two of his great decisive cases and then survey some of the criticisms that were made of him during his lifetime and afterwards. So I think the, the first thing to say about who John Marshall was and this is even though he spent most of his adult life in Richmond, uh, one month a year in Washington, spent a couple years in Philadelphia, six months in Paris. But despite all that experience of, civil, of city living, he was a country boy all his life. Uh, the house he was born in was a log cabin. The second house he grew up in was a frame house. The third had glass in the windows. So this wasn't quite pioneering. It wasn't Daniel Boone going through the Cumberland Gap, but it was out in the country. And it seems to me that Marshall so enjoyed that manner of life that he never entirely forsook it. The word that comes up over and over again in descriptions of him is simple. This word is used by people who are meeting him for the first time. It's used by people who've known him for years. They describe him as simple. Uh, he didn't care how he dressed. I mean, he usually wore pants, but he, but he didn't. <laughs> he, was not, he did not care how he dressed. Uh, he didn't care how his hair was cut. His wife cut it for him. Uh, if she didn't, who knows what would have happened. Uh, he, had simple attitudes toward drinking. He liked it. He liked it a lot. Uh, when he was Chief Justice, the wine merchants of Washington called their best stuff the Supreme Court because he was one of their best customers. Uh, the court had a custom in those days that after the justices heard uh, the cases, and they would go back to their boarding house and discuss them over dinner and afterwards. They could only have wine if it was raining. And I imagine this was to cheer themselves up. So Marshall would always ask one of his colleagues, usually Associate Justice Story, Brother Story, look out the window and, and tell us what the weather is. And Story might say, the sky is perfectly clear. And Marshall would always answer, our jurisdiction is so vast that by the law of chances, it must be raining somewhere. <laughs> So wine was always served at the Marshall Court. Marshall liked simple games all his life. Uh, he regularly walked several miles before breakfast just to get himself going. He did it as long as he was mobile. His nickname in the Army was Silver Heels, partly because his mother uh, sewed socks that had white in the heels but also because Marshall could jump over a bar that rested on the heads of two men. Uh, he loved the game called quoits, which is horseshoes played with, with metal rings, not, not horseshoes. And the point is, as in horseshoes, to get the ring around the post or the meg. And there was a club in Richmond called the Quoits Club. It was a gentleman's club. It meant every Saturday from May to October. And, uh, the, the governor of the state was ex officio a member, but the membership was limited. Uh, the members sang, they gave humorous speeches. Uh, if you mentioned politics or religion, you were fined a case of champagne for the next meeting. And they also played this game of quoits. And people said that Marshall seemed to pay as much attention to judging whose quoit got closest to the meg as he gave to his judicial decisions. So this was, in many respects, a simple man. The man he most admired, apart from his father, Thomas Marshall, was the father of his country. Uh, Marshall volunteered 
to serve in the militia in 1775 when he was 19 years old. And then he joined the Continental Army the next year. He was in the Army almost until the end of the Revolution, 1781. He was in three battles that Washington commanded. Brandywine in September of 1777, Germantown in October of 77, and then Monmouth in June of 1778. And between Germantown and Monmouth, he was at Valley Forge, where Washington was also in command, also presiding. So Marshall saw Washington in defeats. He saw him in victory. He saw him when the army had nothing to do but suffer from lack of clothing, lack of food, lack of pay. And Marshall's conclusion from these experiences was that George Washington was the rock on which the revolution rested. When Washington returned his commission as commander in chief to Congress at the end of 1783, Marshall wrote a letter to his old friend James Monroe. And he said, at length, the military career of the greatest man on earth is closed. May happiness attend him wherever he goes. When I think of that superior man, my full heart overflows with gratitude. Marshall didn't just admire him as a military leader. He agreed with Washington's diagnosis of the political problems that had made the war so difficult for the army. The form of government that the independent America first had, the Articles of Confederation, was inadequate to its task. It didn't give the government uh, the power or the energy to do the things that it had to do. So when reform was necessary, when the Constitutional Convention met in 1787, presided over by Washington, signed by Washington, Marshall follows him once again. He's a delegate to the Virginia Ratifying Convention in 1788. Uh, he gives several speeches there, one on the judiciary. He is a partisan of ratifying the Constitution. Then after it's ratified, goes into effect. Washington is the first president, and a two-party system develops. Not anticipated or mentioned anywhere in the Constitution, but it almost immediately springs up. Marshall follows Washington again in joining the Federalist Party. Uh, this was the party that believed uh, in a financial system that would encourage the growth and diversity of the American economy. And it was a party that believed in a strong armed neutrality in the world war between Britain and revolutionary France. Uh, the other party was the first Republican Party, the party of Jefferson and Madison. It's now the Democratic Party, not the GOP, but it was called the Republican Party in those days. And they took different views on both of those policies. And in 1799, Marshall follows Washington a third time. He is summoned to Mount Vernon along with Washington's nephew, Bushrod Washington. And George Washington tells these two young men, you have to run for Congress in Virginia. The Federalist Party is in trouble in this state. We need new blood. You have to run. Marshall doesn't want to do it. He's a lawyer in private practice. He's a very good one. He's making good money. He started a family, and he's buying land and buying farms, and he needs the income. But Washington keeps insisting. He's after him and after him. And the anecdote about this visit is that Marshall decided he couldn't keep saying no to his former commander in chief, so he decided to get up at the crack of dawn and just leave. But Washington had gotten up earlier and put on his uniform. <laughs> whether, whether that's uh, literally true or not, what Marshall said later was that I yielded to Washington's representations. So he ran for Congress, he was elected to the House, and this puts him on the escalator to be John Adams' Secretary of State and finally Chief Justice. The man that Marshall most hated he didn't hate hardly anybody, but he did hate his second cousin once removed, Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson returned that hatred. Jefferson hated a lot of people, but, but Marshall was always high on his list. 
Uh, Jefferson's opinion was that, that Marshall was a sophist, that he would uh, take any statement and twist it into some predetermined judicial conclusion. Marshall warned Joseph Story before he got on the Supreme Court. He said, you must never give a direct answer to any question that Marshall asks you. If he asked me if the sun were shining, I would say, I don't know, sir. I cannot tell. <laughs> uh, Marshall's opinion of Jefferson was that he was a demagogue, that he pretended to be a hands-off president taking his lead from Congress, but that he secretly manipulated it through the House and did so to ride storms of popular passion for his own benefit. The sundering episode in the relationship happened in 1797 when a letter that Jefferson had written to an Italian friend was published first in Europe, then in England, and finally in America. And in this letter, Jefferson said, uh, his friend was named Philip Mazai, he said, I would put you in a fever if I named men here who have been Solomons in council and Samsons in the field whose heads have been shorn by the harlot England. Now, Solomon, of course, was king of Israel. Samson was a judge of Israel. So this letter was interpreted in America, and certainly by John Marshall, as a direct attack on George Washington. For years, Jefferson had taken the position that Washington was still a good man. He was being manipulated by Hamilton. But here in the Mazai letter, he seems to be pointing his finger directly at Washington. Uh, four years later, when, when Alexander Hamilton is trying to get Federalists to prefer Thomas Jefferson to Aaron Burr after the deadlocked election of 1800, one of the Federalists he writes is John Marshall. And Marshall wrote him back and said, I don't, I don't know Burr, you do. I have to accept your opinion of him. But the morals of the author of the letter to Mazai cannot be pure. This is how Virginia gentleman said he is dead to me. For Marshall, there was, there was no coming back after the Mazai letter. So Marshall uh, serves in Congress after being elected in, uh, for the second term of the Adams administration. Adams makes him Secretary of State after he cleans the Hamilton loyalists out of his cabinet. And then at the end of his administration, the lame duck end of it, because Adams has lost the election of 1800. This is his rematch with Thomas Jefferson. He'd narrowly beaten Jefferson in 1796, but Jefferson beats him rather solidly in 1800. So one thing that departing Federalists do is they pass a Judiciary Act of 1801, which increases the size of the federal judiciary. This was a prudent measure that, that would, would have made justice more widely available to the American people. It was also a patronage measure because they got to fill all these positions with Federalists. But then a very important vacancy opens up because Adams gets a letter from the then Chief Justice, Oliver Ellsworth, third man to hold the job. And Ellsworth has gout. His health is bad. He, he doesn't want to keep doing it. So he tells Adams he's quitting. Adams offers the post to the first man who'd held it, John Jay. Jay was the great uh, revolutionary patriot, spy master, diplomat, author of some Federalist papers. And he was the first Chief Justice from 1789 to 1795. Then he left the court to be governor of New York for two terms. And in 1801, Adams sends his name to the Senate. Jay is confirmed. Then Adams gets a letter from Jay saying that he won't take the appointment. He says that the federal judiciary lacks energy, weight, and dignity. So he's going to stay home in, in New York. Adams has a meeting with his Secretary of State in the still unfinished White House. Uh, the shell has been completed, but the inside is almost like a construction site. And as Marshall recalled it, uh, Adams asked him, who shall I nominate now? And Marshall said, I don't know. I don't know, sir. Adams paused a minute and said, I believe I'll nominate you. So this is how John Marshall, age 45, had his name submitted to the Senate 
He was shortly confirmed, sworn in, and then after a few weeks, he swore in the new president, his second cousin, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> so how did he take this job, which John Jay had refused to hold again, because he, he said it lacked energy, weight, and dignity. How did Marshall supply those qualities to it? I think the first trait he used was geniality. And this helped him work with his fellow justices. When he comes in as chief justice, the court has only six uh, members, so all six of them are Federalists. They've all been appointed by Washington or Adams. But in only 11 years, uh, one man retired, a couple more died, Congress increased the size of the court to seven justices, and by then the partisan balance is two Federalists and five Republicans. That's a significant shift. Yet all these new Republicans voted along with John Marshall. And they continued to do so for most of his tenure. So how did this happen? I think the geniality is, is the first quality. Marshall was not only simple, he was, he was likable and he liked people. When Joseph Story first encountered him as an advocate before the Supreme Court, he wrote home and he said, I love his laugh. I love his laugh. A marshal had a gift for spreading an air of good fellowship around him, and his fellow justices responded to that. Another th technique Marshall used was deference. He would defer to justices who were more expert in particular areas of the law than he was. One example was land titles. Uh, land titles, especially in Kentucky, were very bad. There was bad surveying, lots of conflicts, many cases, a number of which came to the Supreme Court. And Marshall would let those opinions be written by Associate Justice Todd, who was from Kentucky and knew what the situation was. Uh, another area where he deferred was admiralty law. He would often let Joseph Story uh, take the lead there. But when he deferred, he got deference in return. So deference is not only polite or virtuous, it's also smart. You give something and you get something back. The third quality Marshall had is that he's always the smartest man in the room. And his intelligence was not quick. It took a while for him to get going. But when he did, his reasoning could seem almost implacable. His major decisions are eight, nine, 10,000 words long, and they're built like granite. They're supposed to have that solidity and that weight. One advocate before the Supreme Court, William Wirt, who would later become Attorney General, he said that Marshall's mind was like the Atlantic Ocean. Everybody else's everybody else's minds were ponds. So this is an opinion of a, of a legal adept. This is how Marshall struck someone who knew what he was talking about. Marshall used all these qualities over an enormous length of time. Uh, his idol, George Washington, was commander in chief for eight and a half years and then president for eight. So he's, in effect, he's the chief executive of the country either in, in reality or formally for 16 and a half years. Marshall is chief justice for 34 years, twice as long. He's appointed by John Adams. He serves into the second term of Andrew Jackson. He inaugurates five presidents in nine inaugurals. And he still holds the record for length of tenure of a chief justice. And in the middle of that period, the court had a remarkable 12-year stretch where there were no personnel changes. It's only had one, one comparable stretch since. That was in the late, late 20th century. But this is in the center of, uh, of Marshall's rule. So he has 34 years to work his magic on his fellow justices. And he puts them to good use. His most famous case is probably Marbury versus Madison, and we're all taught that in school because it establishes that the court 
can rule a law passed by Congress or a portion of it unconstitutional. I think, well, it's true that that's what Marbury did. I don't think that was news when it happened. Uh, the concept of judicial review was already out there. It was not something that Marshall created. Alexander Hamilton had written about it in the Federalist Papers. Marshall himself had spoken about it in his speech on the judiciary at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Uh, this was a familiar concept. What was most striking at the time about Marbury, it's a 9,000 word decision, and about 8,500 words of it is a lecture to the Jefferson administration. <laughs> It's, it's telling them, you, you thought we were the bad guys, and you said you would be the good guys who do everything right, but you have done wrong by William Marbury. He deserved his commission, and you didn't give it to him. Now, he's not going to get it because the uh, form of redress he's seeking is a portion of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which is, in fact, unconstitutional, but still, shame on you. Many of his decisions had to do with supremacy, the supremacy of the federal judiciary over state courts. Uh, Dartmouth v. Woodward, McCullough v. Maryland, Cones v. Virginia, Osborne v. Second Bank of the United States. Uh, what Marshall is, is contending with there is what Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist had had called a hydra in government. He said 13 courts, different courts of final appeal would be a hydra. And the hydra, of course, was the monster that had many heads on many necks. And if you tried to cut one off, two more would grow. And Hercules only kills it by burning the stubs of the necks as he cuts the heads off. So, so this is what Marshall is trying to do. He's trying to be Hercules in the judicial realm and make sure that the states are not themselves the final courts of appeal. But today I want to focus on, on two other decisions, one having to do with contracts and one having to do with commerce. The first is Fletcher versus Peck. This was in 1810. It had to do with a land sale that the state of Georgia had made in the 1790s. Georgia was the poorest of the original 13 states. All it had was land. It had land that went all the way to the Mississippi, what are now the states of, of Alabama and Mississippi. And so uh, Georgia politicians believed if we can sell this land off, we'll balance our books. So in 1794, they sold 35 million acres for a penny and a half an acre. Every single legislature Latour had been bribed. The going price was $1,000. One man had um, sold his vote for only $600. He explained that he wasn't greedy. Uh, the, the purchasers of this tract, it was called the Yazoo Tract because there's a river, the Yazoo River, that flows into the Mississippi on the western end of it. So Yazoo was the name for the whole chunk. They weren't intending to move to the Yazoo River. They, they were intending to flip their uh, purchases for a profit. And this is a very old American thing, you know, buying real estate and flipping it. And that's what they immediately did. They flipped it to sellers who, in turn, expected to flip it for profits of their own. But while this was going on, uh, the state of Georgia had a new election. All the corrupt legislators were turned out of office, uh, and the new crop uh, wrote a repeal act which nullified the sale and also forbade it from being litigated in Georgia courts. They established a penalty that any Georgia state employee who so much as referred to it would be fined $1,000. Uh, they stipulated that the act be burned in the public square of the state capitol. And when, when uh, the fire was about to be lit, supposedly an old man stepped out of the crowd and said that the fruits of corruption should be burned by fire from heaven. So he took a magnifying glass out of his jacket and held it up to the sun. And that's how the original Yazoo sale was ignited. But meanwhile, the purchasers had resold and there were new purchasers. And they wanted to know what was the legal status of this land they've just bought. So they consulted one of the best lawyers in the country, Alexander Hamilton, who was 
no longer at the Treasury Department. He was in private practice in New York. And he wrote a trim little 500-word opinion in which he said that if this goes to court, the courts will probably rule, according to the contract clause of the Constitution, that the original sale was a contract and states may not impair it. This is according to Article I, Section 10, which prevents the states from impairing the obligation of contract. And Hamilton's opinion was published in a pamphlet in 1795 or 96. So this, uh, this state of affairs went on for a number of years. The Yazoo purchasers tried to get relief from Congress, uh, where, where all relief measures were blocked. So they turned to the courts in the 1800s. There was, but how, how, were they, how were they going to do it? They couldn't go to a Georgia court. Georgia had blocked that option. Citizens of other states could not sue the state of Georgia because the 11th Amendment forbade that. That was the First Amendment after the first 10. Uh, it was passed very rapidly, only, only two years, and it forbade citizens of other states from suing a state not their own in court. But if two citizens of different states are involved in a lawsuit, that is a matter for federal jurisdiction. So Robert Fletcher of New Hampshire sued John Peck of Massachusetts. Peck had sold him some Yazoo land for $3,000. And Fletcher went to court to say, you don't legitimately own this because the Repeal Act has nullified the original sale. I want my $3,000 back. This case rose to the Supreme Court in 1809, but there was a technical problem with one of the uh, appeals, so it was re-argued in 1810. And Marshall wrote the decision. And his decision is essentially an expanded version of Alexander Hamilton's opinion of 1795. Marshall says that the Repeal Act impairs the obligation of contract. The original sale was a contract, and Georgia is trying to impair it, and this is unconstitutional. He, all, he says it in a very audacious way. He says that Article I, Section 10 is a bill of rights for the people of each state. Now, we think of the Bill of Rights and at the time, the Bill of Rights was thought of as the first 10 amendments, you know, protecting freedom of speech, freedom of the press, right to keep and bear arms, no warrantless searches. That's what we think of as the Bill of Rights. But Marshall's saying, no, before the first 10 amendments, there was already a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. And that was Article I, Section 10 which forbids the states from impairing the obligations of contracts. This is how important Marshall thought contracts were. He wanted to instill a sense of discipline on the American people. If you sign on the dotted line, if you put it down in black and white, you've got to do it. And you can't count on some legislature at a later date to save your bacon. Or you, you need not fear that you're contract will be nullified by, polit by state politicians later on. So he is, he is trying to secure the ability of Americans to contract with each other. In 1824, there's a second case having to do with commerce. And this is uh, Gibbons versus Ogden. It's known as the steamboat case. Now, steamboats were invented several different times at the end of the 18th and early 19th century. Uh, several people figured out how to take a Watt steam engine, which was a new innovation, and put it on a boat and convert its power into a mechanism that would turn a paddle wheel. Uh, one of these inventors was Robert Fulton. And he demonstrated his first boat on the Seine in France. And one of the spectators was the American minister to France, Robert Livingston. Uh, several earlier steamboat inventors had failed because they'd lacked the money. Livingston was a wealthy New York grandee. When he saw Fulton's steamboat, 
uh, he thought this is it, he would become a backer of Fulton. So you had the boat, you had the money, but the third thing that you needed was political protection. This is something that Livingston could also arrange because he knew everybody in the state of New York. So in 1808, New York granted him and Fulton a monopoly on steamboats in New York waters for 30 years. In 1811, they added that if the monopolists were sued, the steamboats of, of those who were suing them would be impounded while litigation proceeded. So that's a nice extra guarantee. And they, the competition sprung up immediately. Uh, people saw how this worked. They built their own boats. Uh, they took the monopoly to court. Uh, New York's Supreme Court upheld the monopoly. Another thing the monopoly did was it bought off the competition. There were some businessmen in Albany who had two boats, and so the monopoly said, all right, we'll give you Lake Champlain, but we're going to keep the Hudson River and New York Harbor and Long Island Sound. Another competitor they bought off was a New Jersey man, Aaron Ogden, who was running a boat from Elizabeth, New Jersey into Staten Island. So they, uh, Ogden and the monopoly went to court in New Jersey, and this had a a tragic conclusion because as Fulton was crossing back to New York City over the Hudson River, now this is in the winter, there are no bridges so you have to go over the ice, and Fulton's lawyer Thomas Addis Emmett fell through the ice into the Hudson. Fulton pulled him out but he, he caught a fatal case of pneumonia. So he died saving his lawyer's life. Uh, if there are any lawyers here, I hope you, you remember that act of gallantry. But the monopoly marched on, and they came to an arrangement with Ogden. He'd pay them $600 a year. He'd be a licensee of the monopoly so he could run his boat uh, into Staten Island. Now, Ogden himself took on a partner, Thomas Gibbons. And for a couple of years, their partnership worked very well. But then there was a crisis in Gibbons' family. A rumor went abroad that Gibbons's daughter had slept with her fiance. <coughs> Gibbons's solution to this rumor was that he and his wife and his daughter should all sign an advertisement in the newspaper saying that the rumor was false. Apparently the rumor was true, but Mr. Gibbons wanted to take out this family ad. Aaron Ogden thought this was a bad idea, but his opinion so enraged Gibbons but Gibbons came to Ogden's house with a bullwhip. Ogden fled out the back door and sued Gibbons for trespass. This ended their partnership. <laughs> Gibbons hired as his, as his uh, boatman a ferry boatman from Staten Island named Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, he was a young man, he was uneducated, but he was great for this situation. He loved it. He built a secret compartment inside Gibbons' boats so that when process servers came aboard, no one could find him. Uh, he loved dodging through New York Harbor, chased, uh, chased by the harbor police. He was also sent to Washington, D.C. to hire counsel. And the counsel he hired was Daniel Webster, congressman, and at this point, rising as the greatest lawyer in the United States. So when Gibbons v. Ogden comes to the Supreme Court in 1824, Daniel Webster makes an eloquent argument on behalf of Gibbons. Now, the issue was there is a Commerce Clause in the Constitution which says that Congress has uh, power over the commerce of the United States. But Congress had passed no laws having to do with steamboats or steamboat traffic in New York State. So, Thomas Addis Emmett and the lawyers for the monopoly said, well, of course, if Congress passes a law, we have to obey it, but Congress has passed no law, so in the absence of any law, New York State has a right to form a monopoly for steamboats within its waters. Webster's argument uh, denied that. He said, even in the absence of action by Congress, commerce is of such importance and of such unity that it has to be left in Congress's hands. He said the con commerce of the United States is a unit 
He described it as e pluribus unum. And after Marshall gave his decision, he said, the Chief Justice took my argument as a baby takes its mother's milk. Well, that wasn't quite right. Uh, Marshall in his decision, another long one, he essentially repeats Webster's argument. And he says, I'm not satisfied that it's been refuted. But then he hangs his decision on a smaller point, which was that Gibbons boats had a federal coasting license. Now, what was a federal coasting license? It was a piece of ID for revenue purposes. It proved that you had an American boat, so you would not be subject to penalties that we put on foreign boats. You know, we did this in, in order to protect uh, American shipping. And that's what the coasting license was for. But Marshall said a license is a license to do a thing. So if you have a coasting license, even if it was intended as a revenue measure, you have a license to coast. And therefore, you can take your boat from Elizabeth into Staten Island. So this was a victory uh, for Gibbons, a defeat for the monopoly. A week after the decision came down, the first combat competitor's boat sailed into New York Harbor, firing cannon. The people waved at it from the shore, and the number of steamboats in New York waters quadrupled almost immediately. Now, why do I tell these stories of these particular cases? I like the backstories, uh, and I think, I think it is interesting in a life of Marshall to look beyond his own life to the lives of his litigants. Marshall and the Supreme Court are hearing cases at the end of their run. They've risen up through the legal system and then they arrive at the Supreme Court. But at the beginning, when they're first brought to court, and even before that, there's a long story of people wanting something, people fearing something, people entangled. And to try and resolve that, they go to court. So I think it's important for us to look back and see why these Americans are bringing their problems into court. But the other reason uh, that I focus on these particular cases is that they establish the armature for the American economic system. You know, when we think of founding fathers who are responsible for our economic system, we mostly think of Alexander Hamilton, particularly after the musical. Uh, and, you know, rightly so. And, and I, I like the musical. I'm a fan. And, and he certainly deserves all that credit. But his plans and his achievements had to have legal support as well. And in Marshall's contract law decisions and in his commerce decision, even though Gibbons versus Ogden is a little a, a little uh, reserved, there's a little, that little twist in it. Uh, he, he lays the legal support for a national market in which people are free to contract with each other. And it's a system that, that we still have despite uh, many modifications and criticisms of it. Marshall himself took a lot of criticism in his career and after. His most uh, industrious enemy was Jefferson. Not so much in public, but in letters that he wrote. Jefferson spent his presidency and his retirement years fretting about Mar Marshall decisions. Uh, he called Marshall's reasoning twistifications. He compared his decisions to the eels of the law. He said he hangs inference upon inference like Jacob's ladder. And he tried at the end of his life to suggest an alternative. He said, these questions should not rest with the Supreme Court. If it's a constitutional question, it should be resolved in a constitutional convention. That should be the mechanism by which these questions are decided. And he, he ran this idea past his, his, his protege and his right hand, James Madison. And then Madison did what, what he so often did with his beloved elder. He, he was like the man holding the, the guy rope to the dirigible. And he, you know, he just gave it a little earth, earthly tug. And he said, 
you know, a series of constitutional conventions would be tardy, troublesome, and expensive. And Jefferson never, never made the site proposal publicly. Uh, another Jeffersonian who did make public proposals was uh, Senator Richard Johnson. Uh, he's most famous for having killed Tecumseh at the Battle of the Thames in the War of 1812. He's probably second most famous for his campaign jingle, Ripsy, Ramsey, Rumsey, Dumpsey, I did Johnson kill Tecumseh. <laughs> but he, he deserves to be more famous than that. He was a serious man. Uh, he was a serious a small d Democrat, a serious populist. And he thought it was wrong that the ultimate judge of these questions should be the unelected Supreme Court. So he proposed a series of amendments in the early 1820s. He proposed uh, to restrict the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, he proposed that the Senate could have a veto on court decisions. Uh, he proposed an amendment that the court, if it was deciding a constitutional question, would have to have a supermajority. None of these amendments went anywhere. Uh, none of them got out of Congress. Most of them were squelched in committee. Then maybe the court's most eloquent critic after Marshall died would be Abraham Lincoln. This is because of the Dred Scott decision of 1857, written by Marshall's successor, Roger Tawney. Uh, and when uh, Dred Scott was the second decision to overturn a law of Congress, uh, it overturned the Missouri Compromise. And uh, it enraged opinion in the North, and Lincoln attacked it repeatedly up until his first inaugural address, which he's delivering in the presence of Roger Tawney himself, who's, who's about to swear him in. Uh, Tawney was described that day as looking like a galvanized corpse. <laughs> but Lincoln, Lincoln, who was a lawyer himself, he admitted that Supreme Court decisions were final as to the parties of the cases. So uh, poor Dred Scott would have to remain a slave because that's what the Supreme Court had ruled. But should the decision have precedential value in similar cases? And here Lincoln said, he distinguished, he said there were Supreme Court decisions which were settled and decisions which were erroneous. And a settled decision would have to follow the previous practice of the government, and it would also have to be unanimous. Red Scott was not unanimous. It was a, a majority opinion of six with, two con with uh, one concurrence and two dissents. The court had expanded uh, to nine justices by 1857. So Lincoln is saying a settled decision has to be unanimous. That would get rid of a lot of Supreme Court decisions, even some martial court decisions. Many of those were unanimous, but not all of them, not all of them were, and even some of the most important ones had concurrences or dissents. So Lincoln was erecting a very high standard. And he said, if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably, irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, the instant they are made, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers having, to that extent, practically consigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. Now, unlike uh, Senator Johnson or unlike Thomas Jefferson, Lincoln had no practical solution to propose to this. But he raised the issue, he raised the criticism. And it keeps coming back. I mean, whenever some party or large group of people is unhappy with the Supreme Court, we hear of plans to restrict it, either to restrict its jurisdiction, um, more, more recently to pack it. No one has suggested a Senate veto recently, although uh, Professor Mark Tushnet at Harvard uh, has been talking in those terms for a number of years. So this is an ongoing question about John Marshall's legacy. Marshall himself dies in 1835, I think a disappointed man. I, th I think he feared that he had failed. 
He was losing his control of the court in the last few years. Uh, new judges, more difficult to influence or be led. Uh, he was also very disappointed with the election and re-election of Andrew Jackson. If Jackson had not been elected, re-elected in 1832, I think Marshall uh, would have retired in the hope that the new president would have promoted Justice Story to be Chief Justice. But Jackson won re-election, so Marshall uh, stayed on until he died. And uh, Jackson's uh, statement on Marshall's death was surprisingly gracious, much more gracious than anything that Marshall and Jefferson ever said of each other. But the most gracious tribute to Marshall came from Richmond, and it came from the Quoits Club. And they ruled that because he was irreplaceable, the club should have one fewer member forever after. So thank you very much, and I'll take questions now. Uh, we have a microphone there and a microphone there. Hi. Yes. My question is about the institution of slavery. And uh, John Marshall was, could you explain his personal life as having been, having owned slaves and... And that, how he ruled. And how he, yes. Right. And, and um, if, if perchance, if, if he... My guess is that he was chosen because there were other Southern Supreme Court justices on the court at the time, the small, the small R's or the Republicans versus the Federalists, and that's why he was chosen versus John Jay, who was a very strong Federalist who would probably be op opposing the, the Southern Republicans quite a lot. If, if, and if John Jay, who was an abolitionist, right, yes, if he yes. had, if he had, uh, been chosen, this, if he had stayed, I mean, if he right. had decided sure. to become the Supreme Court Justice. Sure. Um, well, and Jay lived a long Donald. time. He lived until uh, 1828 or 9, uh, and, and he was, as you say, an abolitionist. Um, there's been a discovery about Marshall uh, earlier this year, a man named Paul Finkelman, and I was, I was lucky enough to finish my book after his came out. I, I knew it was coming out, and I we corresponded, and he, he was very gracious about his results. He found that, that Marshall owned 10 times as many slaves as, as we'd ever thought he did. Uh, every biography I had read said that he owned 10 or 12 slaves. And, and this was based on records of purchases that he made, which stop in the 1790s. So people tracked him up to that point and then assumed the number stayed static. But what what Finkelman did was he looked at Marshall's wills. Marshall wrote a couple of them, you know, changed them, added some codicils, and he looked at properties that he left to his various sons, and then he compared these with census records, which showed how many slaves were attached to these properties. And he concluded that, you know, Marshall probably had 130 to 150 slaves by the time he's uh, at the end of his life, and he gives, you know, chunks of them to various uh, of his children. Uh, Marshall's slavery jurisprudence, he hears a number of cases uh, having to do with slaves. Probably the, the most famous, and the one I write about in my book, is the Antelope. This is about a slave ship uh, that was captured cruising off the coast of Florida and brought into Savannah. And this is long after the United States has illegalized the slave trade, but it still went on uh, in, on the slide for a number of years. And it's a very complicated case. There were Spanish and Portuguese claimants who, who claimed to own uh, most of the slaves on this ship. And, uh, you know, Marshall admits in his decision that uh, slavery and the slave trade are against the laws of nature. It's, it's against the law of nature to compel someone to labor for you without compensation. Uh, but he falls back on the law of nations, uh, which he says uh, all nations possess equal rights. He says Russia is equal to Geneva. You know, Russia is the largest country on earth then, and Geneva is a Swiss city-state, but they're two, they're two nations, so 
So they're equal. So Spain and Portugal are still engaged in the slave trade, and it's not the business of the United States uh, to stop them from doing it. Uh, Marshall follows the positive law. Uh, and he, he doesn't use the spirit that he brings to his Cherokee cases, his two Cherokee cases, uh, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia and uh, Worcester v. Georgia. Uh, the first was a defeat for the Cherokees, but Marshall all but asked for a second case. He said, you know, we could look at this question again in a proper case with proper parties. So he, the second one, Worcester v. Georgia, it, it is a victory for the Cherokees who want to remain in Georgia and not be um, either subservient to the laws of Georgia or, or expelled from the state, and nothing happens. I mean, Marshall made his decision. Georgia ignored it. Uh, the president um, was not enforcing it, and finally the uh, two missionaries who were bringing the case, Samuel Worcester and another man, they dropped their suit. So um, the end result is that the Cherokees uh, were expelled to Oklahoma. But there Marshall was, uh, seems to have been looking for a way to help American Indians. He doesn't seem to me to do that for, for slaves. And this is an area where I think he does not follow the example of his Federalist idols. Uh, Washington owned slaves all his life, but he freed all his slaves in his will. And he knew that would be a public statement. He knew people would take that as a public statement. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is one of the founders of the New York Manumission Society, which is instrumental in turning New York from a slave state to a free state. A marshal uh, accepts slavery as it is. Next question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name's Ed Spanis. I recently wrote a series on John Marshall, Alexander Hamilton, and the American System, which was published on my wife's blog, which is called American System Now. Um, in doing that, over the years, I've read a lot of books on John Marshall, and I found yours, I must say, very readable, and I really like the way you told the stories about the cases. Uh, Thank which you. Is <laughs> Go out and buy the book. <laughs> yeah. You want me to sit down now, probably? <laughs> Uh, one thing that struck me was that almost all writers about Marshall talk about his nationalism, and you avoided that label or that characterization. I, th I think it's maybe in one point. Um, and I know Mar nationalism has taken on sort of a bad connotation in the 20th century, but his nationalism, I think, was, this, was the nationalism of Alexander Hamilton, which was nation building, right? And as you allude to at a number of points, he took, you call it, I think, the armature of the American economic system. I called it Marshall establishing. Is there a question? The, yeah, the legal infrastructure of it. Um, I know you've studied both men. Can you say anything more, I'm sure you can, about the relationship between Hamilton and Marshall? Well, um, they may have met as early as Valley Forge. Uh, they were both there. Uh, certainly, they're corresponding by the 1790s. Uh, when Marshall comes to write his biography of George Washington. It's the only book he ever writes. He doesn't write a book on the law. He writes a biography of George Washington. And he, he praises every Federalist that he names. And of Hamilton, he said he had a patient industry, not always the companion of genius. Very, very shrewd. Uh, the reason I uh, didn't use the word nationalism is it would have been anachronistic. I mean, I, I agree with you that I think there was there was national sentiment there and something that we would call nationalism, but it just wasn't a word uh, that Hamilton or Marshall used. So that's the only reason I didn't use it. Uh, next question. Thank you so much for your extraordinary remarks. Um, I look forward to reading your book. Great. The um, Marbury versus Madison case has been set a law, although when Justice Scalia at his confirmation hearings was asked uh, about his opinion. He re declined to comment on the case. Um, and there has been Tushner, as you said, uh, at Harvard, from the leftist perspective, has taken uh, a more restrictive perspective. There's been issues between conservatives, originalists, textualists, critical legal theorists. 
uh, and libertarians on whether or not Marshall's opinion was in fact supported by the text of Article 3 uh, because it was, again, not um, its inherent power as opposed to textual power. He makes the decision in Marbury using a lot of dicta, talking, in, as you said, to Jefferson and his administration about what should have been done with Marbury, but then on the basis of jurisdiction in the statute, says it's not a case of original jurisdiction finding the, the statute unconstitutional. Uh, therefore, Marbury can't get his writ of mandamus. Correct. Which is the remedy that he's seeking. So, so interestingly, he asserts judicial power and the right to review in a case in which um, he finds in favor of the executive, although he chastises the executive. But in the case in the case that you cite, Worcester versus Georgia, he finds in favor of the Cherokee, yet Jackson, as the executive, refuses to carry out the order of the court. That's right. Well, but the court, okay, he made his decision, and it was, the decision was that treaties with Indians are the responsibility of the federal government, not the states. Correct. The federal government made a treaty with the Cherokees, granting them this land, and it's not the place of Georgia to interfere with those arrangements. Now, Georgia had no intention of obeying this decision, and Jackson is supposed to have said Mr. Marshall's made his decision, let him enforce it. That's probably apocryphal. It's like recorded 30 years afterwards. But he did say in a letter to a friend of his that Marshall's decision has fallen stillborn. Now, we're missing the last act because the next step would have been that the imprisoned missionaries who were suing the state of Georgia would then have asked their lawyer to notify the court that the decision had not been put into effect. And then you would have had the clash between the president and the court. What would have happened? Would Jackson have defied the court? Or if he had gone along with the court, now the politics of this, remember at the same time that this is all going on, South Carolina has nullified the tariff. And Jackson is contemplating a force bill, a bill to allow them to collect the tariff in South Carolina by force if they keep this up. If he follows the court and moves against Georgia, will Georgia join South Carolina in the resistance? And will Mississippi and Alabama also do it because they have Choctaws and Chickasaws who are also at risk of being moved beyond the Mississippi and they they want them out of there. The white governments of those states want them out of there. So Jackson is trying to prevent this local defiance in South Carolina from spreading to three other states. This is the political crisis, and the missionaries, the backers of the missionaries, the American um, Missionary Board, which was the Congregationalist group that employed them, they told these guys in prison, they said, look, uh, the unity of the country is at stake here. You should drop your suit, and they did. So you didn't get to that final step. Now, in defense of these missionaries, when the Cherokees, you know, a new treaty was extorted from the Cherokees, and then off they were uh, force marched to Oklahoma, these two missionaries went with them, and they died in Oklahoma with their parishioners. So they dropped their suit, but, but they were loyal to their parishioners. OK, that's, uh, that's all we have time for. But thank you very much for, for coming. <laughs> Folks, just a reminder, there is a book signing one level up at the Archives Bookstore. Books are at the cash registers. Holidays are just around the corner. Yeah.